Theater is a collaborative effort, and bringing it all together into one creative vision is the director. Hello, I'm Andrew Lenzi, Artistic Director of Primary Stages for the American Theater Wing, and I am very happy to welcome three directors who have shared their art and vision with audiences both on and off Broadway. Cheryl Keller was a Tony nominee for Next Fall, and her directing credits include projects at a variety of not-profit theaters on both coasts. Closer to home, she's worked with companies including The New Group, New York Stage and Film, and directed Off-Broadway's Adrift in Macau for Primary Stages. Pam McKinnon no, is an Obie-winning director, yes, currently working on Broadway's Clybourne she Park. Her, she has directed strange. several Stop. Edward Albee no, plays, no, including no, Who's no, Afraid no, of Virginia no, Woolf, which took her back to Steppenwolf. And next season, she'll be directing Harrison, Texas by Horton Foote for Primary Stages. And Stephen Wadsworth, who divides his time between the worlds of opera and theater, he has directed operas for La Scala, Vienna State Opera, Covent Garden, Seattle Opera, and the Metropolitan Opera. His most recent stage work is Masterclass, currently running in London, which he also directed last season on Broadway. He is the James S. Marcus Faculty Fellow at the Juilliard School, where he leads the advanced training program for singers and head of dramatic studies at the Metropolitan Opera. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. So today is about the director. Tell me, and um, what makes a great director? I don't know, you have That's to the ask big question. <laughs> <laughs> ask some actors. <laughs> ask some actors. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think there is something. It, it is inherently a verbal art form. Mm -hmm. um, it is about uh, communicating with a wide array of people. Um, you know, uh, uh, producers, you know, who, who maybe are, are more interested in, in you know, um, staying on budget and, and, the, and the advertising and how to, you know, sort of put this show into a context. Um, it's also, of course, communicating daily with actors once you're in the rehearsal hall. It's communicating with visual artists, a whole, you know, series of, 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 of designers. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there is, an, inherently, there is something verbal going on. Um, and then, you know, I, I also really think that it's about showing up on time, awake, and yeah. ready to um, give and receive. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's showing up prepared, but also, you know, willing to roll with whatever those great collaborators also bring to the table, you know, and, 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 and having the ability to sort of uh, commit to the best idea, not necessarily your idea. Uh, it's about showing up and just doing the best job you can do every day and always being willing to punt, I think. Yeah. I think that, you, you, you know, you, you have to do your homework, you have to have your vision, and I think circumstantially, I think when you're working on a commercial production, you're a different kind of collaborator than you, when you're working on a workshop at New York Stage and Film or a full production at a not-for-profit like Primary Stages. I think you have to kind of like a, a mixing board. You have to kind of ride your skill sets right. depending on the circumstance you're in, always, always, always being true to the written word, always being true mm -hmm. to what is on that page. And, and, and uh, keeping your eye on not on you you have to one has to make compromises but you can't compromise the work mm -hmm. right and so you know given that at some point all give and take included you have to make a decision and you're the you're the decider the right. powers of persuasion are which is <laughs> another word for communication right but it's like you need to I think you need to unify your various voices, whether there's a bunch of actors who are trying to figure something out in a scene or, you know, a bunch of producers or a playwright or whatever that you're trying to get on the same page because a, a page has to be gotten on eventually. That's you well, know. Well, well, how do you do that as a, as a director? I mean, how are you the unifier? And, and how, perhaps we could talk about your design teams and all of that. How do you unify a production? having a connection with a play and having some sort of vision for it. Now that is going to differ from person to person because we all are differently, you know, uh, differently sort of gifted or talented. There's th strengths that are different in, yeah. in each of us. And, um, <clears throat> and I think part of learning how to play the game is, is bringing your weaknesses up to your strengths uh, right. over time and through this experience of these various situations that we've just been describing. But um, I think that that 
you know, having a vision which is, and the ability to articulate it in a way that is um, uh, persuasive and and um, and inspiring to people, makes mm -hmm. people make people want to mm -hmm. want to play. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. Right. You mean I think the ability to play well with others is quite it's important. Huge. You're not <laughs> yelling at people all the time. Hmm? You're not yelling at people all the time. I mean, um, no, I hear that that we are. But I, but I've I never know. encountered yeah, that. No, no yeah. these guys are the, are the <laughs> most wonderful people in the business. I think that I've had the privilege, I've only worked on new works. So by the time I get to production, I've for the most part been through a couple of readings, a workshop or two or three or four. Uh, and so I, I, I'm really clear as to what the play or musical requires mm -hmm. and I think that uh, it, it, without yelling I don't yeah we, I, we're not yeller I mean I'm not a yeller <laughs> either really, yeah. um, I think that um, I think that no is a complete sentence sometimes too I think that to get bogged down sometimes as a director in the reasons all the time I think you have to show a certain amount of knowledge and authority by very nicely and simply saying no that doesn't work and know when you have to explain it more or know when it's just simply the confidence of knowing that it's not the right thing or mm -hmm. as Pam said before someone comes in with a better idea best idea in the room wins yeah. because ultimately it's going to service the play to the best of right. our ability right, right. so there's a funny combination of egolessness and egofulness. Exactly. You know, I mean, you have to, to, as I said, a page has to be gotten on. And at a certain point, all of the disparate or may, hopefully not so disparate, you know, things in the room have to be corralled into something coherent. Mm -hmm. And you have to be um, able to lead everyone to that point and say, well, I think that as a producer, that's what I look for in all of you is to sort of helm the production and get us there to that next that next moment um, where in a calm, smooth, timely fashion, as we mentioned, time is important. So so tell me a little bit about how um, you you work with your design teams and, and, and getting back to this idea of collaboration. Um, what is that process like for for you, Pam? Um, I just had a, a very initial uh, design meeting a couple days ago, actually for the show that I'm doing for you at Primary Stages, and it's it's a series of three short plays by Horton Foote. So there is, you know, in, in order to make um, a, a, a coherent evening that both honors the the differences among those plays, but makes it an you know, a, a, a coherent whole, um, my set designer has to really attack this as a, a puzzle to be solved. And, and we just chatted about the play. I mean, you know, it, it, um, she, she sent me a few uh, basic research images. Um, these are all plays that take place in interiors, um, but the research images that she just sent sort of, you know, via online was actually um, more landscapey, like just like this is what this, area of Texas looks like as, you know, a reference point. Right. Do with it as you will. But then we just talk through the plays and it's a mixture of talking through tone. Um, sometimes it is talking really specifics of like, I really need a refrigerator. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, please, 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 it can, you, know, you can strip the kitchen down, but give me a fridge. You know, so you, you sort of swing back and forth between like the lofty idea Whoops. of like, this is a messy world. This is a dangerous world. This is a prickly world. You know, whatever sort of crazy yeah. adjectives that aren't uh, inherently visual even. Um, but knowing that you know every once in a while like yes we need to have a sofa is actually a really germane thing to talk about mm -hmm. so I really appreciate designers who are willing to sort of soar in the clouds and then semicolon get you know sort of mm -hmm. nitty-gritty um, and don't feel ashamed about either trajectory because mm -hmm. I think it, they're both really important like it is it's a plastic art form it is you know uh, it's 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 bodies in space so what is this space so but but you know a very you know she didn't sketch anything she didn't bring anything to the table um, and then um, last night in you know my, my email were some interior images again we're not going to go that literal necessarily but this is what you know these worlds would be if we were making the movie, um, maybe. You know, it's, it, it, it's that kind of, like, next volley. So I'm, I'm a big fan of, like, grabbing these little conversations so that there isn't, like, one deadline-y, 
you know, experience of like, now we must solve the problem. Like we right. get to sort of dream for a while, yeah. which is really important. And then, you know, at a certain point, I'm hoping really early, we swing in the lighting designer, yes. who is also a big visual thinker. I, I rely on lighting designers a ton. I do a lot of new plays as well. And there's like, uh, they're, they're musical thinkers, they're visual thinkers. They're sort of, I, what they do is kind of mysterious to me. Like, you know, a set designer, it's sort of like, it's walls and a sofa, I get it. Um, <laughs> lighting, it's sort of like, whoa, you just trans yeah. you just changed the play. How did you right. do that? How did you know that green was our color like it's crazy town what they can do right. um, and so you know to have people who uh, you know there, there is a real musicality in what they do and there's something very ephemeral about it it's it, 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 it's, it's it's more like 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 the like the sound of language um, and that can really you know be evocative so it's just multiple I don't know again conversations I keep on going back to yeah. that and the ephemeralness yeah it's a word helps you live in the imagination mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I because I think that it's it, it, through conversation it's about living in this um, this uh, the, the always always it's about the imagination it's about you're putting something on a stage and and it, it the, the world it I, I think like you it has to start off with the world is your oyster mm -hmm. like no limitless right. right at the very beginning and you work with people hopefully that you love to work with and speak a similar language to you and it and and you know the, the money doesn't play in at the beginning and sometimes not even the space plays in at the beginning it's about real and imagined and the lighting and the sound and what uh, design elements like I'm working on a play uh, next year where the soundscape what we hear to me is the driving force of the play mm -hmm. so I'm starting with a sound designer I'm not mm -hmm. even starting and I've never done that before I've never mm -hmm. started set not first yeah, and I'm starting yeah. first on this particular project with the sound designer. And is the designer going to be in the room? Yes the yeah. whole time the yeah. designer is going to be in the room and we're going to create it together through a workshop of it. So there's that's another way, to, and I've never done it before, so it's very exciting to me to be able to do it that way. And who knows uh, how much that'll influence what the play looks like, mm -hmm. what the, and, and what a lighting designer can get from it, or costume designer, et cetera. Yeah. I think I love to, you know, I, I do see, I do need to see initially space in a concrete way, and I don't necessarily need a designer to do that, so, I do need a designer who can work with someone who is visual to s in some way and has certain convictions about how things should look. And, and for me, the designers that I've started with, Thomas Lynch, a set designer, right. and uh, Dunya Ramikova, a, set, uh, a costume designer, and also Martin Pakladinas, mm -hmm. costume designer, and Peter Kazarowski. We, Peter and Marty and I did our first show in together in 1988 mm -hmm. and have worked that's been our, the primary team that I've worked with over all of this time. And we always come back to, you know, what is the next time that we can be together and make that work. And I th what I discovered about Tom and Dunya, who were the first really important visual people that I worked with, is that they were, I mean, I think those two people taught me more about seeing and about directing in some way the organization of space and the you know the 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 incredible layered reality of a a piece of clothing i do a lot of uh, you know period work yes. so and a lot of 18th century work over time and working with dunya and marty in the business of you know, using every element of that craft to tell a story. Well, I remember you when you were doing Mirabeau, talking about your process working with your costume designer yeah. and, and how you would think, first take each character and then you would look at different fabrics. Yeah, I mean, that's, different. and it's become more more that way. I, I, I love to do that. I mean, there's some, it depends on the designer. Now I have, I'm working now with a, with a younger designer for the first time on a show at Juilliard and and she's fantastic, you know, she's mm. half French, so she's totally keyed mm. into a European way of uh, sort of metabolizing period clothes, which I think is important. And, um, but she's, uh, she drew first out of the conversations, but the next step, which I'm hungering for, is when the bags of, of swatches come into the room. Just mm -hmm. a lot of them. And we just right. go through them and we're like, 
I like this color, I like this, uh, the way this feels, this is right for this, and class, and fabric, and color, and character, and all of these rather abstract things become so concrete and so thrilling in, mm -hmm. in the, in the um, handling of them. And you all have existing relationships with designers, and, um, and I think you probably find that that's, it, it kind of cuts through a lot of the courting stage, perhaps, or, or getting to know each other, you know, in that yeah. early process. I think the, the whole thing about collaboration is, for me, is if I get a sense about an actor in an audition that that person knows something that I need to know, <laughs> I have a good feeling about that person. There's something that they carry in them that is fascinating and uh, uh, at first maybe a little hard to articulate. Well, let's talk about that. What makes, what makes that actor stand out for you in the room? I work with a, with a lot of actors and I'm always amazed at what they can do. Um, you know, and after a while, uh, you know, they really help me read a play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's sort of like, oh, I can't imagine, um, you know, I'm working on Clyburn Park. I can't imagine anyone but Christina now in that role. And, you know, and, and we continue to change things, um, but there is something, you know, she brought that you know, that language and, that, and that, that syntax and that person. And, you know, she made her this strange duck in Act yeah. One of Clybourne Park. And it's sort of, it's like, what else is that play if not, you know, with Chris? And I sort of feel that way. But, uh, you know, a, a, a number of actors that I've worked with are mm -hmm. sort of right. like, wow, great, there it is. Now I can really think about this specifically. I mean, it's like what you yeah. said about grabbing the fabric and it's sort of like, Okay, all right. I, I just like it, it, it unlocks something in me mm -hmm. that lets me think more deeply about it, lets me feel more deeply about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, sort of the, the epicenter of where I'm holding a play sort of goes from the brain to other places in my body once I'm dealing with, you know, a, an actor that can really lift something off the page. Uh, yeah, that, that also, uh, I remember the first play that I did opera for a while, for 10 years really before I did a play. Yeah. The first play I did, I had. Catherine Barowitz, Mary Lou Rosado, and John Michael Higgins were in the mm. cast. There were others in the cast that were wonderful too, but those three particularly, Mary Lou would, would and it was a new adaptation, it was one of those Marivaux plays yeah. that I had done, so, you know, it was, there was a lot of firsts happening. <laughs> and, and they, uh, Michael uh, Higgins has the most uh, uncanny sense of what works and what doesn't work, and it's very fast, yeah. and, it's, and it's very keen, it's also, he gets me, he got me immediately, so he, knew what I was going for, and he would say, ta, 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 and Mary Lou would think for a minute, and then she would say, you know, there's something wrong with this line. It just doesn't work as the next line. Mm -hmm. So, and several times, I would go back to the French and see how I had translated it and realize that in some way I had compromised mm -hmm. something with the choice that I'd made in the place that she was sniffing out. Right. You know, and, yes. and Kathy Barts was also, just a, as an actor director thing she was looking at this person who'd come from directing opera where a lot of the the process is out of order in terms mm -hmm. of what we're used mm -hmm. to yes, in the, yes, in the sure. spoken theater and um and s she was looking at me like i was you know insane yeah. and so the, and she really um helped me understand what she's what actors who don't sing specifically uh, might need mm -hmm. and how they think about what the, the work which is just something that I hadn't spent a lot of time yes you know yeah thinking yeah. about before so those people were all people to whom I I still feel you know like baseline indebted yeah. like I feel the, about the way of gr the people who were great teachers in school who were you know that's the way I feel about all those people they, mm -hmm. especially how they give of themselves in a new play yes. because the playwrights in the room with you nine mm -hmm tenths of the time, I would say. Um, and so, uh, particularly when you have a playwright who's uh, keen to that, can see how it fits on an actor, a really mm -hmm. great actor. And sometimes the actor doesn't even have to say this doesn't work. You can, t I just did uh, uh, reading uh, a new Billy Porter play that a Patha Merck's in. And when she was working too hard, we knew mm. we had to change it. Yeah. Because uh, the stuff that, because she's so fertile yeah. So that when she, even just sitting at a table with her reading it, we were able to tell, oh, but we have to work on this section. We have to work. She didn't even have to say anything. Mm -hmm. And then I was also 
uh, it, it's a trickier beast with actors in musicals because the requirements are so different. Mm -hmm. And you have to, when you're casting actors in a musical, they have to fit the vocal requirements first because mm -hmm. the music is the part of a musical that nine times out of ten doesn't change, even in a new piece, because if you change the key to a song, it resonates differently. And certain right, songs right, just right. have to be in certain keys or in a certain vocal type or your, you know, especially in opera, um, you know, you're building this ensemble of voices. Right. And uh, I went to see a production of Pippin that the role of Pippin wasn't being sung by a tenor. It was being sung by a baritone. Mm -hmm. And it surprised me how much it changed the whole play for me. Mm -hmm. right. I couldn't. I, and not because I was used to it as a tenor, just because it didn't speak. It didn't sing. It didn't resonate in the same way so then so you do your first layer of casting in a musical when they fit the vocal requirements and then you try to get like what you guys are talking about about the pixie dust with the actors when they come into the room whether they can teach us something or bring something or just be humble wonderful brilliant collaborators uh, so it's it's a whole different who are process. somehow you know who look the part or who have some right. quality about right, them right 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 so right that you can't Ignore that, yes. even if they're not exactly changing the shape of the room, or if you, there's slightly less pixie dust you know, right, than right. there was for, you know, the the other lead or whatever. You know, I mean, I think <laughs> yeah, that there are lots of, lots of, uh, of uh, considerations there. But well, let's talk a little bit about working with um, the playwrights, and I mean, all of you, even masterclass, Terrence was in the room, I'm sure. And and what is that process like for you, as a director? Well, again, I, it's just so different. I mean, the the living playwrights that I've worked with are three: Terrence McNally, on, no, but not on a new play. Right. Beth Henley and Anna Devere Smith. So, I mean, I just say the names, and you're like, well, they're all weird, seriously <laughs> different. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and the process of working with them is also very different. I I, I find it, it it's pretty bracing to have a a playwright in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's there's another uh, eagle eye there, mm -hmm. and to which you have to defer. I remember at one point I was I was um, talking to one of these casts and saying, you know, I had gotten notes from the playwright, mm -hmm. which I was communicating to the cast, and I said, you know, it's not always just a case of being able to interpret the play the way it feels right to us. Mm -hmm. We have to interpret the play the way the playwright feels it. Right. And we also have to make it enough hours that we feel liberated and free to do what we need to do. But, you know, the, the frustrating at late when you're in previews and you get a, a bunch of directives um, which feel like they go a little bit against mm -hmm. the decisions you've made and the directions you've gone in, but there's a kind of flexibility that you have to have there in order to serve the playwright's vision of the play. <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful to be able to pick up a play that's 300 years old and say, you know, really, <laughs> I think we can cut this long, <laughs> you know, um, or whatever, you know, or to reshape it in whatever way to sort of conceptualize as part of the work. But that's really not the case. Uh, of the living. It's not the order uh, of first order of business. Well, it's really the, the collaborative. Part. It's the true collaboration because you have the other director in the room. I think it depends on the playwright too. Mm -hmm. Like on next fall, Jeffrey Knopfs is an actor as well. He started his whole life as an actor. So it wasn't the most difficult process in the world to talk him into give him give them a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, they might you might hear it differently, but give me two or three days uh, let them have a chance and then we'll change it if mm -hmm. we need to. And I also think it depends on when you come to the play. Um, you know, because I know you've worked with, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Albee on also o older plays, as but well as, new. Re yeah. as well as new. So you probably, uh, but like when the play that we did together, the Chris Durang play, I got as a nine page play. So I was in on the ground floor of that thing. So I mm -hmm. had almost as much voice as Chris and Peter, the composer, Peter Melnick, as they did because mm -hmm. I was in it in such, I mean, yeah. nine pages is what I got first. And Chris <laughs> said, what do you think? Right, <laughs> and I said, enough. you're Chris Durang, let's do it. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. so, so uh, different from you coming in to um, 
an older play by Edward or a newer play by Edward, and also the personality of the writer. I mean, you know, we know uh, the play that the Chris Durang play that Andrew and I worked on together. We had to get Durang out of the room. Mm -hmm. He well, was, was stifling the actors, mm -hmm. and we yeah. and I went into Andrew's office and I said, "Okay, we need to do this together." And that's also, I think, part of the collaboration, knowing what you can do by yourself or where you need the artistic director to help you. And you know what he did? He left the room for a, well, a little bit. Well, I think it's bit. important. I always talk to young playwrights yeah. about, you know, there is a moment when, especially if, even if it's your world premiere and this is the first production ever, <laughs> but you've got to leave that room. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And why is that? I mean, I think inherently, uh, uh, director as well as actors it's sort of like we want to please like there is something mm -hmm. you know sort of like oh I, I, I took this job because I believe in this story I believe in, in in the pieces that make the story I'm you know this is fantastic I'm starting to feel like I own it but I want to I know that this came this sprang from your head <laughs> I mean you know and 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 even if it was you know a commission a writer like no like especially playwriting like 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 no play actually has to exist Mm -hmm. you know period but you know these these people they they you know go to a cafe or they sit in their living room or they scribble on the subway and all of a sudden then they hand it over so there is sort of a i don't know there there there, there is something at once compelling as well as you recognize that either sort of i'm i'm honored i'm honored to have these pages and i think sometimes actors there is a point where they know that while they they will get there they're not there and, there, and there, there's a mortification factor of like, I'm so sorry. Right. Um, you know, and, 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 and sometimes you, you sort of learn in drips and drabs, oh, this character is loosely based on your mother. How can I possibly live up to that? And how dare you make me try to live up to that? Um, you know, because I am my own person and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pouring myself into this. Um, so yeah, so you have to let me do it, and with you you sitting there and you know on occasion frowning, I'm going to assume it's frowning about me, um, you know. And and so it, it you know it, these these are tiny rooms. These are you know delicate moments. Um, mm. You know even like like that sort of you know marching through the second week, let's say of a three or four week, five week rehearsal process, um, when actors are 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 you know, really committing lines to memory and knowing that, oh, I don't quite have this one down and you, of course, as the writer, know it verbatim. Yeah. Um, it just, it just, you know, it's just undue pressure um, when actually we need sort of, uh, we need un, uh, unfettered and sort of unconscious time mm. to make some mistakes so we get there. Um, yeah, that's the tricky thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's, uh, service is the, is the big word in, in, in my world about uh, what I'm, what my role is, you know, and w if it is service to the actor, to the audience, to the play, mm -hmm. um, and then to this, a specific vision of the play, which I am not in control of, which I might otherwise be if the, if the playwright weren't there or weren't alive. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I think that that's a fine line between interpretation and the freedom to interpret. I mean, you get a bunch of actors who are all looking for a way to imagine the early life of their character or the what happened yesterday. And that doesn't take, that's an exciting conversation. It's one of the most fun things. Yeah. You're like, oh, I think you went to the ball and I think you screwed that girl. And, and then <laughs> I think that happened. And then I think she called you up and then and he's like, no, she didn't call me up. You know, so that, just the invention of the life of a character, it can go past this, uh, this author's way of thinking of that so easily, mm -hmm. so quickly. And sometimes you can prevail um, and say, you know, this isn't a choice which is reductive about the material. Mm -hmm. This is actually a choice which might open up a further door in it. And of course, that's the dilemma of the playwright in the room. He's having a much harder time than we are, usually, Sorry. or she, you know, sitting there going, oh, God, you know, why did I ever do this? Absolutely. This is the most important thing I've ever done. Or I feel such passionate conviction about it, and I have it in my ear so specifically. Sometimes it's very, very difficult for them to shift, and sometimes it's not appropriate for them to shift. So it's up right. to us as the, the servers to uh, try to serve all masters, and it just makes for one more master there. So you, ha so let's say you have this, this, everybody in the room, the actors are telling you there's this moment in the play that needs to be changed, I, it's not working for me. How do you have that conversation with your playwright? 
I think it depends on the playwright. I, I think that I, I have been spoiled by playwrights who came up around the same time as me, and those years of those Naked Angels years and the lab years and all that about um, being honest, they, they, these guys, uh, I've worked with a lot of playwrights with a lot thick skins. Although I remember uh, Pam and I, I, I uh, one night a playwright was really hard on me and Pam and I were sitting on a panel together and she saw that I was a little off and she said do you remember this and she yeah. said what happened and I said oh he's so upset with me and she kind of went so okay that happened you, 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 uh, <laughs> I have a thinner skin sometimes I have to work on having a thicker yeah. skin I think it's about talking the playwright into uh, it, it, illuminating and illustrating to him or her that their, their story will be told in a better way if they make this change. It's not about this is the way I want to change your play, this is the story that I want to tell, because in service to the playwright, we're telling their story. So I think it's really important as a director, particularly of new works, to understand dramaturgy, to understand storytelling, and to explain to a writer, I, I feel like I've hit 95% when I can explain to them that their story, the story they want to tell, the vision that they have for the play, will be better served if they change it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that this moment is undercutting this part of the story. That's a good word, undercut. You undercut what you're trying to say <laughs> if you say it this way. And I think when playwrights, particularly ones that are collaborative and easier to work with, I mean, sometimes playwrights are just hard to work with, just like sometimes directors are hard to work with, just like sometimes designers are hard to work with. But I think directors who are open to change get prickly when you try to change the story. Why don't we have this character tell the story instead of this character? Mm -hmm. that, that you're not going to get listened to, and that is where we have to have that reverence mm -hmm. to the story that they want to tell. Um, and that's also where you want to have been working on it from the start. Yes. You know, yes. and coming in when there's nine pages, um, so that <laughs> a lot of that work can be done in the, as it's built. Um, when I work on new operas, really exclusively, I mm -hmm. work with people who now, I mean the last four or five times, who have not started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a, some sense I'm part of the team and it's a dramaturg-director relationship. And I'm there to be a script doctor and a troubleshooter and a red alert whistler. <laughs> you know, so I say this, this, I don't think this is the right gesture dramaturgically for this content. You know, we have to get form and content better in sync and, you know, so, but it's as we're making it. Now, it's not necessarily easier, you know, <laughs> um, and, and it's, it's a hell of a way to get to know someone. Certainly, <laughs> you know, it's trial yeah. by fire, man. We're just, uh, <laughs> I'm just starting a new project, uh, an adaptation of the novel Bel Canto oh. by Ann Patchett, yeah. which is, um, this young Peruvian composer, Jimmy Lopez, and Nilo Cruz mm. writing the libretto. Wow. Um, Latin Americans working on this subject. And so we've just started to have our intense conversations about what, you know, a basic shape of things. And, uh, you know, there's three people with really intense responses, and Nilo has to come up with a treatment. Yeah. So what he has to do, what we sort of established in our two hour breakfast the other day was, you know, I have to just like corral this material into a kind of a, a shape that I can Im imagine. And then, you know, if there's X, X, and X layering or reordering, that happens then. I mean, we were talking, I would say, well, no, I think it's pretty important that maybe we, you know, when is the act break going to happen? All this kind of thing. Right. You know, just right. we got right in there. And it was uh, a spirited conversation, yeah. <laughs> you know, and great. I mean, yeah. wonderful. And, uh, but, but there's a lot of, you know, it all comes from, you know, it's really not about three difficult people normally. It's about three passionate exactly. convictions um, mm -hmm. or two or however many sort of uh, trying to figure each other out and, and really not wanting to let go of things that feel um, beautiful. Yeah. You know? Well, and, 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 and very quickly, there is something outside of everyone, like there is, there is the production. Mm -hmm. There is, you know, and I think, I think if you can embrace that, and it goes, right. you know, it sort of steps onto what you were saying about there's an external story that is now out there. So this is not a personal attack exactly. when I ask for something or when you ask something of me. It's like, oh, right, there's, there's something that we have created, 
and now we are in service of that. There mm -hmm. was one, um, I was working with Edward on um, his, I guess, his reimagining of the, of, of, of the zoo story, where mm -hmm. the zoo story, you know, at, at that point, a more than 50-year-old play, was now the second act of a two-act evening, and we were having a really hard time. It's just really hard. It's really hard material, and the stakes are high, and all that good stuff. And 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 the rehearsal hall with my two actors, wonderful actors, and eventually we we we, we cracked into something fantastic. Dallas Roberts and Bill Pullman and I. But that triangle wasn't working. There was like we sort of it was a early preview kind of standstill of this moment just wasn't mm -hmm. yeah. falling in. And Edward um, would stop by rehearsals about once a week in that process and you know be very generous and a little scary and do his Edward thing <laughs> and um, and I and I you know I, I I waved the little flag like a few days earlier and I said like it's it's really hard it's right. really hard could you come on Wednesday and not Friday mm, I'll see if I can do that yes and he was there <laughs> and and it was fantastic and the power of the writer he just sort of, you know, made our triangle collaboration a square yes, yeah. with a particular kind of gravitas, and it's his fucking play, excuse me. <laughs> um, but but he did this amazing thing. He listened to sort of our grievances and 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 our problems, yeah. and and then um, he called over the assistant director who had a copy of the script, and he opened up to a certain section, and. Um, because he knew we were at loggerheads, and some of it was fear-based. It was, had nothing to do with really the work. And he looked at a page, and he took out a pen, and he said, you actually don't need this. And he, like, crossed out two and a half pages of the zoo story and <laughs> said, now go back and rehearse this. Wow. Like, he, he, sort of, he sort of said, oh, you are, there, there's a wall, for whatever reason. And he said, I have the power... Like, I don't want to stay in rehearsal. I don't want to deal with your, your grievances and this is difficult, right, difficult, right. difficult. I know it's difficult. But I'm now going to change the text, force the parameters that you're working on to shift, and now you have to go rehearse it differently. Right. Bye. I'll see yeah. you on yeah, yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> Hope it gets better. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe I also, maybe he also, you know, cut out... A, the heart of the problem too, right. you know. Right, absolutely. No, which is the value both, of not both, having him in the room for both. A sort of, he too. he cut out like 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 maybe content-wise some of our difficulty, mm -hmm. but yeah. but in some respects it was more the gesture of like just get to work, yeah, like yeah. you know just just do some work. And this is as a writer, this is my power. Like my biggest power is to shift the text, mm -hmm. so I will shift it for you. And now I'm forcing you to rehearse this differently. Yeah. Mm. Bye. It was amazing. It was kind of amazing, you know, to do, and that's, you know, the power of a living playwright. This right, is a, right. this is a play, you know, a canonical American play, but he's still around, and he can take that red pen out whenever he wants to. Yeah. So how, how did it end up? Was it's great. It better for it. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, yeah. it's great, and it really sort of taught us the lesson of, oh right, we're supposed to be rehearsing and we're supposed to be, <laughs> right. you know, digging into this, right. and yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It reminds us that sometimes we have to shake it up a yeah. little bit too. When a, you know, when when you see the power. I think, as you're saying, Pam, when you see the power of that, I'll call it the red pen, but it's usually a pencil in rehearsal, but when you see that power of even just taking out a single word mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's negligible. A single mm -hmm. word is always negligible, always. But when a playwright does that and it shakes it up, yeah. it's like, oh, wow, I, as a director, you also have the power to do that. That's what the playground of collaboration and rehearsal is. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and again, living in our imaginations mm -hmm. in a way where we can say, okay, let's do it this way, let's right. do it that way, let's do it this right. way, because a playwright knows that, a, yeah. a, a, and a very good playwright, yeah. needless to say. Yeah. Um, and we were in a rut, and yeah. he said, well, there's no need to be in a rut, just get out of the rut. Right. I don't know if this is the solution, but you're not gonna be in that rut anymore. Yeah. Okay. It was interesting, and uh, with Masterclass, which Terrence had done 15 years before we came and did this second, right. you know, Broadway production, um, we were in Washington, and he said a couple of times, "Oh, I'm thinking, you know, I, I listened to the play, and I think that oh God, some of it maybe should change, and I don't know what I'm thinking of." I said, "Don't change a word. It's it's." Mm -hmm really brilliant and even right. if it has some jagged edges that you're feeling or seeing you know I feel like this is a classic text this is a great text it's, it's exquisitely pulled together it's just amazing from the mm -hmm. play W-R-I-G-H-T yes. ing point of view it's really incredible and um, so I said don't 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 so he said oh, all right, I won't and we kept working on it I said plus you know let us 
let's, let's see whether, you don't even, you know, tell me what the problems are, just, you know, and then in notes he would say, this is awkward or that's awkward, or you can try to do this or try to do that, and mm -hmm. that would be fine. But then in London, third time around, having previously done it in Washington, then Broadway, then, um, he said, uh, fairly early, after an early preview, he said, I want to cut three lines. Mm. And he, there were three lines that he put his finger on, three places that in one sense, in one instance because I'd staged it in a certain way, that mm. he sort of did me a favor and cut a line. Although I hadn't been complaining about it, he, put, he said, this is just a, too long. Let's do it. Right. Then in another instance, it was really a case of, of how, we had, uh, how we had worked out one of the characters, which was quite different from the way he had experienced that the first time around. Right. And he liked that direction, and so he cut one of her lines. And then the third line that got cut was about, it was about a singer who was particularly beloved in London. And mm. he said, I think I've... I think I've cracked that joke <laughs> right. by that time, and I can lose that. <laughs> right. So very neat, keen, three little things. Right. Well, now here's another department of directing. So that's great, and I kind of went, oh, brilliant, this is so good. Because in those three little places, it will just pick up, you know, you can cut something that actually takes um, three sec eight seconds to say, but you know, the brain farts necessary to kind of engineer it into place. When you've cut the line, you somehow are 15 seconds shorter in the scene or 30 seconds, because everything mm. moves so much more fluidly without it. So that was all great. And then, then I sat down with the women in the scene. And um, I sort of said, oh, we're going to cut this line. <laughs> <Drick and work. laughs> Scary. And with, uh, well, it, but, it, but it's also the way they work. I mean, Tyne Daly, who plays Kallus in this production, she, the way she, she threads everything together so, so I mean, over time. I mean, she right. figures out, you know, it's just astonishing. So I realized that to, to remove a couple of these lines, they all affected mm -hmm. her, mm -hmm. to, to take that away meant that there was a premise bound to be a couple of things in that line that she was using to sort of, you know, make sense of what came later and all the things. So she had to do, you know, minor surgery three times, and I had to do that with her and sort of say, stay, stay still, stay right. still, you know. <laughs> You're so what if we stuck this needle into your skin here and pulled it tight? You know, it's, it really is a very visceral mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thing for them, and it, and it was... You know, and of course, every actor thinks it's because they can't deliver the line. Yeah. Right. Person right, so I'm quickly. not funny. Yeah. Well, right. actually, you're very funny. It's really not about that. Well, right. You know, That's I mean, kind of the beauty of a collaboration <laughs> going on for a long time. Like, next fall, by the time we made it to Broadway, we were working on it for a year. So mm -hmm. by that time, the actors had lost that. They didn't think yeah. that. Like, off-Broadway, every time something changed, it, they thought it was because of them. Yeah. Now we're on Broadway because of the production that we all did together, and we, like you, are being supported. We were supported in not cast. The producers supported us in taking the original off-Broadway mm -hmm. cast and moving it to Broadway. So mm -hmm. by the time we got to Broadway, that was one thing I had to take off my... I, I was able to take off my lip. Mm -hmm. Their feelings didn't get hurt when things were changed. They knew it was I don't know part, that their feelings... Uh, or they didn't think that they, they worry about it. Yeah, they worry yeah, about yeah. it. Whatever the yeah. reason, it's not we were a able to. Thing, we, when yeah. you're working, talk about collaboration. I think that time, and the time that you work together, and the length of time that you work together, or yeah. the years that you work together with certain. You know, you mentioned Tom Lynch. I've done uh, so many shows with him, and mm -hmm. we have a shorthand, and and there isn't that. Uh, some of the scariness or, or the, uh, oh, the, is this me because of what I'm doing, goes away mm -hmm. after time and years yeah. and, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of a tapestry kind of collaboration that you mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. What's also beautiful about the, the, the Terrence story is that, you know, uh, Tyne and Diane Pilkington, this uh, British woman who joined the cast in London, uh, Diane had only had a little time. Tyne had worked on the play for two years. Yeah. But th it, it was because they loved what they were doing. And they loved, they had come, they'd figured out how to love those lines. Mm. Yes. Mm. So Maybe losing them was, is, it's just complex. It's like, you know, everybody got down to business and in a couple of days we s had it sorted, you know, but we had right. to 
work on it and work on it and just run it a few times and get mm -hmm. comfortable and then do it again the next day and just, mm -hmm. you know. So, but that's a very interesting part of what we, what we end up doing, you know, on every side of a little cut, there's, right. there, know, there's, there's a, there's a action you know, and reaction. There are different interactions yeah. that, yeah. that require your, um, you know, patience and uh, diplomacy. And how much do you guys listen to the audiences and how does that affect you? And especially in the first, I would say, for me, it's always the first two previews is, is your biggest moment. And, but what, what do you, what happens if you don't get what you're expecting to hear? Um, you have to, you do pay attention to the audience, but you have to know your play and what you want to pay attention to them for. And I think that varies from play to play. You know that if you have, let's say, Nathan Lane on a stage, he might take a week to land all those jokes. So you don't have to pay attention to the audience if they're not laughing at the odd right, couple. Right. One, the you know, I'm saying shows I haven't done. You know, the well, first, second, Nathan or Lane, third. He'll figure out he'll yeah, figure really out. fast. Exactly. He'll, he'll yeah. use the previews for his own end. Or you know, or or uh, you know, but the play that we did together, we really used your audiences to hone the humor in mm -hmm. that play because mm -hmm. that was what the task was. Yeah. Um, for other plays, I, I always pay attention to when they get restless. That's yeah. me, that's a big thing for me, yeah. is when I feel coughing. a lot of moving and coughing and things like that, I say, okay, program. and drop the sound program. sound of 75 <laughs> people moving to the other buttock. Yes, th it, those are the <laughs> things yeah. that I'm I pay attention to. And that be recorded, Steve. <laughs> that's the stuff I pay attention yeah. to. Um, and then on Broadway, it's a different beast because um, uh, you also, you have to pay attention to the business side of it. Really, like, I hate to say it, but in a Broadway audience, you have to know how many $26.50, $26.50 butts are in the seats because they'll go to the bathroom no matter how good it is, <laughs> you know, I, or, or again, a subscription base, whether it's an older audience or a younger mm -hmm. audience. So I think it's just so circumstantial to the yeah. piece and to the audience and to how much time you have and to when the critics are coming. I think it's all, because I think that is part of our job uh, to, in order to, to, you know, in order for, for us to have a healthy run, it's about the critics. It's so, it, it, so I think it's all of that. In commercial, I mean, it really is a not-for-profit, yes. which is one of the great glories of the regional theater system in America. Is it's, right. You know. Pam, you mentioned that audiences were different in Los Angeles when you did Clybourne and, and, and how the play changed with that. Well, some of it, I, I, mean, I mean, I don't know if it was city specific, but it was certainly venue specific. I mean, mm -hmm. I first did Clybourne Park at Playwrights Horizon, so a 199 seat house versus the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles, so a 720 seat house. In quite a different configuration. In a hugely with different, its, right. With uh, acoustical problems and also, depending on how you Dress that stage distance mm -hmm. problems, mm -hmm. you know, for some of the audience. It's yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, the Mark Taper Forum. It's called a forum for a specific reason. It's a semicircle of a stage, mm -hmm. and so you know, if you have someone downstage center, which could feel like a very strong mm -hmm. place to deliver something at Playwrights Horizons, which is a small proscenium or end space, mm -hmm. um, well, that means actually probably half the audience at the taper is behind that person, yeah. so yeah. not so strong anymore. Yeah. So, you know, so, so it required definitely a lot of restaging, and, yeah. I, and I, I agree with you. That, that can be heartbreaking for actors, too, yes. especially if they've done it before. Yes. Your wife, we did a touring production, and we ended yeah. up at the Long Wharf after playing two mm. beautiful proscenium, mm -hmm. this is proscenium show. I had happened to have done it in a thrust before, but when we got to Long Wharf, and we had to reblock, you know, 70% yeah. of the actual Mm, Those changes. actors were yeah. in tears yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Because there's, I mean, it, it's a biological act. Yeah. Right. Like there is something yeah. I used to, I used to have my wife at this distance. Why is she yeah. all the way over there? Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge house. I need my actors to actually play some distance. You know, it's very interesting. But, but what I did find in a positive way, Bruce Norris, who wrote Clybourne Park, he wrote a big house play, I believe. So that, for instance, there, there, there are sometimes, you know, three laughs in a row at Playwrights Horizons. We would get the first one. Right. And then sort of like an understanding and an understanding after the second and the third. A big house is actually, they're, 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 they're more anonymous, and they're also there for that kind of 
ha 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 ride right. and we would get every single laugh and it was just it's it was a, rev a revelation yeah, next the fall, same problem, we, oh, yeah. yeah we had the opposite mm -hmm. when we moved from playwrights to right. the helen hayes jeffrey did a lot in threes he mm -hmm. did a lot of three laugh things and we found from going from a 96 seat theater to a 650 seat theater that we could only get two jokes to land mm -hmm. because the laughter landed lasted longer in right. the 650 it's, coming from, away. it's yeah. coming from further away so yeah. we took a lot of three joke uh, sections and turn them into two joke sections wow. during previews. That's we use yeah. previews a right. lot for that, and uh, and also the blocking thing is really it, it, we, yeah. you have to depending on your space and depending on the size and uh, the blocking affected a lot of humor as sure. well. How to land the humor from well, ninety six to sixty. In the in the vaudeville theater in London, where Masterclass yes. is at the moment, it's sort of as if you take a shoebox and you stand it on its end, mm. right. very narrow. Right. And it's very high. Right. And you have two balconies. So the first week of previews, I sat in a box so that I could clock what that what what was going on in the in the orchestra section, the stalls, <laughs> and what was in the balconies. So I could hear. Yeah. And in the first mm -hmm. several performances, I realized that the people upstairs weren't laughing. Right. They had a different show. So then I went up and sat there, and I realized that they actually didn't laugh because they were afraid they might miss something because they couldn't quite hear it mm -hmm. well enough. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, we're, so we're, you, we're coming to our final moment, so I, I would love to hear from each of you for closing where you go for inspiration as directors. What interests me are the, are the complicated in-between bits of personal interaction and how people behave and why. Mm -hmm. That is what a what it is about yeah I mean it's it's you know yeah taking trying to be open taking stuff in um, uh, I love to travel when I can I mean that's an inspiration I read a lot of fiction when I can mm -hmm. um, I also try to see stuff I mean I think I think my my, my tastes are quite Catholic um, and I and I can definitely I love going you know to the opera I love going to you know I, I, I sit on the board of a, a small downtown company clubbed thumb you know embrace their work um, you know uh, see stuff on Broadway I mean you know I have uh, other people's work I love you know going to the Whitney I mean yeah. yeah so for our final I would say you know the first place I always go is to my family and how they how we navigate each other is very uh, informative and inspiring to me. And I'm with you guys, I, 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 because I have also the privilege of two children um, in college or in high school or in grade school, I go, I, what inspires me is what makes people do what we do right at the beginning. Yeah. So to watch these college students up there hmm. right now and uh, fiction, Picture Great. Books. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, these programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of City University of New York in partnership with our friends at SUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Andrew Lenzi, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theater, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the wing, and thanks for watching.